Good evening, everyone. My name is Balint. Can you all hear me okay? If I don't use the mic, is that cool? All right. Um, I'd like to give you a, a sort of brief whirlwind tour of all the things you can do uh, with software defined radio in terms of um, hacking all sorts of wireless comms. Um, if at any stage anybody has any questions, please ask. Um, usually this, this talk is a lot longer, so I've sort of tried to compress it down and um, show you some pretty pictures and maybe skim over some of the, the hardcore details. But if you have, have questions, please do ask. Um, I've sort of been obsessed with radio and SDR for quite a while now, but um, just over a year ago, I was fortunate enough to uh, move from Sydney, Australia to, uh, to the Bay Area and join Edis Research. Um, you might recognize the name. We um, make software to find radios. But um, I'd like to sort of tell you a little bit about my journey into it, um, my brief experience with possible pager systems, then I went into tracking aeroplanes, decoding um, downlink signals from satellites, a bit of direction finding, and I'm sure you've all heard of Fast Track. Um, so originally, I was standing on my radio and I heard this signal one day. Can anybody? Does anybody recognize that? Can anybody tell me what it, what it might be? Mm -hmm. It's not dial-up. Yeah, yeah. It's a pager. It might be. Was it? Paging control yes, yes. channel for a trunked radio system. Um, it, it's slightly simpler, but but I was I was perplexed. I hadn't really um, sort of listened to digital signal before. This was my setup at the time. Um, I had inherited these radios from my grandfather, and I'd hooked them up to my 286 so that I could stream the audio across the network and control them remotely. Uh, and so I was looking at this particular signal, both in the time domain and the frequency domain. Um, so this is... Oh, can I have a show of hands? Who's sort of familiar with some basic RF concepts, you know, signals, DSP? All right, that's excellent. Um, so time domain, frequency domain. Here you can see um, this sort of repeating pattern, and then what looks to be the payload after that. So preamble is very important with bursty transmissions, because it allows the receiver to lock onto the signal. Uh, but in the frequency domain, you can see that there seem to be two distinct levels. So this is a, a very simple form of frequency shift keying, and so you can just slice through that and then extract the bits at the appropriate time. Once you do extract the ones and zeros, well, of course, that's great, and this very much ties into the excellent presentation we saw um, just before. You know, how do you interpret these bits? Um, over the course of five years, I would come back to this project and, and sort of reinvestigate. It just so happened that I was looking at Wikipedia one day, and I saw these... Uh, magic numbers appear in the Wikipedia article uh, for this particular communications protocol. Uh, I thought, hang on, I've seen those hex things before, and in this little program um, that I put together that allows you to move the bits around, um, you know, there they are. It turns out it is, in fact, uh, pages. But the interesting thing was the pages software that I attempted to use to decode it didn't work. So I think they were using the security through obscurity by tweaking the, the protocol a little bit. Um, but um, it turned out to be the sort of private hospital pager network that had been established in Sydney between ooh, between uh, various hospitals. So uh, after sniffing <laughs> a little bit, I would see messages like this, and then occasionally I would see messages like this as well. <laughs> so um, so that that was my sort of first little experience. Um, I've always loved aviation as well. This is me on a plane with my GPS receiver who's attached to the um, stick attached to the window. Um, and it's cool because as you take off, you can get some interesting stats about your plane. Um, here, this is another one where I just had it uh, recording a track and bring it to Google Earth and, and create some pretty pictures. Um, but, you know, that's, that's you sort of on the inside. How does air traffic control manage a, a sky full of planes? Well, you probably remember these sorts of radars at uh, various airports. Um, this all belongs to what's called the uh, air traffic control radar beacon system. And there's the primary and secondary systems. So the primary is the, the big honking sort of dish there. And the secondary sits on top. And these communicate with aircraft or send out um, pulses to be reflected by essentially um, flying bricks in the sky, the course code in the metal. So the primary is your sort of traditional radar and the radar will send out a really powerful pulse um, and it's called essentially painting the skins of the aircraft and then the, it will listen for a return which will be incredibly weak it's fourth order loss because it's um, a passive system and then as the dish obviously rotates you have the, the blips appear on your scope but the thing is without an additional enhancement those blips would be anonymous so you would just say oh there's an aircraft there but you wouldn't know what it is 
So that's where the secondary system comes in. And this is an active system. So uh, it's directional. As the radar spins around, it's sending out an interrogation to the aircraft. And the aircraft are then required to have a transponder on board that will be triggered by that interrogation. And then the aircraft will actively respond with particular information about what it is. So then the blips are no longer anonymous, but might have the, you know, the aircraft ID or, or um, the score code, which um, air traffic control assigns it. So this is an example of a transponder. Um, there are various modes in which transponders can operate. Uh, a just simply replies with a score code, that's something air traffic control assigns it, a four-digit code. Uh, C is augmented with the altitude, so that you can um, have that um, uh, vertical resolution as well. And then mode S, which is the cool one. Who's heard of mode S? ADSB. Okay. So uh, all modern sort of aircraft jetliners uh, are equipped with ADSB mode S. Uh, this is just an, an, an initial mode that has longer messages that are sent back and can contain much more information. And it's also used in the ACAS, TCAS uh, traffic collision avoidance system so the planes don't collide. Um, so A and C are actually technically part of the secondary surveillance radar system. And mode S was sort of tacked on because they, they figured, well, we've already got this frequency, um, we can use the same sort of radio hardware, it'll, it'll be less, less cost. But the problem is, because there are so many transponders in the sky now, this channel is very, very busy. If you, if you, I mean, I haven't, but I hear that um, the airspace around Frankfurt, for example, uh, is just totally chopper block um, with messages. But um, so ADSB means automatic dependent surveillance broadcast, and so a plane will constantly broadcast its position, heading, altitude, vertical rate, flight ID, score code. And um, a typical 747 nowadays, apparently, has about 31 radios on board. So there's lots of different things um, to listen to. Uh, and that makes people like me quite happy. <laughs> um, so don't um, consider this as a complete accurate plot, because some of these are sort of guessed, but I was flying recently and I took this photo and I sort of started trying to ID the various uh, antennas on the aircraft. And there are also additional ones that you can't seem to do with um, sort of beacons and uh, the radar altimeter and things like this. Uh, but specifically for Mode S then, the way it works is that uh, it sends out these, these very uh, finely timed pulses. So the preamble, remember I showed you before with the, with the pager system, this preamble exists here to identify what sort of payload this is going to be, and then you have the payload that contains that information that I showed you. Um, and the thing about these pulses are that they last for a very, very short period of time. And so you need to have a very high sampling rate to be able to decode it. So you can't just get away with your old radios like I showed you before. You need some, some um, hardware that will run at a, at a faster rate. And so this is... Um... Hmm? What happened? This is where software to find radio is supposed to come in. <laughs> but, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, so this was um, the first sort of popular, well-known software-defined radio. This was sort of um, the Edis Research um, initial first flagship product. And it's really neat because you hook it up to your computer by USB 2, and you can put these daughter boards on, and depending on what daughter board you put on, it'll sort of give you transmit and receive a certain frequency ranges. So the one I was playing around with initially, um, would give you transmit and receive between 50 megahertz and 2.2 gigahertz, so quite a large portion of the spectrum. And you could actually sample data from the device uh, between 250 kilosamples per second up to 60 megahertz. So that enables you to receive a 16 megahertz chunk of the radio spectrum. Um, then, sort of uh, at the other end, this is a, a much cheaper thing receive only, USB you plug in. It actually appears as an audio card, so you don't need to explicitly install drivers for it, which is a pretty clever way of doing it, but that limits you to a very, very narrow bandwidth. Uh, the first version here was only 48 kilohertz. Um, and then, you, many of you probably heard about the Realtek DVB-T dongles. Um, they're actually supposed to be used for digital TV reception, but somebody figured out that you could turn them into sort of a general purpose, really cheap SDR. Um, so. This is, um, you know, at the other end now, this is actually the latest Edis Research release product that came out maybe two days ago. Um, the specs have significantly improved in recent years due to 
sort of your more amazing um, specs of individual chips. But this is USB 3 now. You can go up to 56 megahertz of bandwidth and go from 70 meg up to 6 gig, so you can explore much more of the spectrum. And it's bus powered as well, so you don't need to excel power. Um, so once you actually have the hardware, you need to send samples into the computer and start doing stuff. GNU Radio is an open source um, sort of software defined radio framework. And GNU Radio Companion within that is this sort of graphical environment where you can string together these blocks that represent sources like the USRP, uh, syncs like the audio card on your computer, and various DSP blocks. In this case, this arrangement will actually do some simple AM demod. So you could you know, tune up your radio and listen to an AM radio station um, using your computer. So this is just a simple example. This here is actually part of the GSM 2G mobile spectrum. Um, here you can see the broadcast control channel, and then you have various traffic channels, um, you know, the, the probably downlinks um, from the tower to people's mobile phones. Um, and this one actually is 56 megahertz looking at two independent um, Wi-Fi channels. So these are the bursts coming you know, to and from an AP or, and, and various clients. Um, and then you can potentially de decode that if you like. Uh, this is pretty much the entirety of the Amazon Radio band. So this is 25 megahertz across this is the entire thing. So you can like, select any frequency at once and, and zoom into that and have a listen. Um, this is an example of a stereo FM receiver that does RDS decoding. You know, RDS in your car it prints out the, the name of the station and so on, but it also gives you traffic information. Um, and so this is sort of the running list of the frames, and then if you demod the FM, you can see the mono left plus right um, audio, the summed audio channel, the 19 kilohertz pilot, um, the left minus right stereo difference channel, and then the RDS subcarrier. Um, and then there's also an RDS and Serif FM transmitter. And so I've got my little iPod um, Nano there. It's tuned in listening to music, but this text actually I program, well, it's the default programmatically set information is XML file that the RDS encoder reads upon boot. Um, like your yeah, scanner that you can buy as an amateur radio um, person, this is just this flow graph doing a scan through these frequencies listed below one by one. It waits for the channel to go silent, goes on to the next channel. But the reason why SDR is so cool is because you can parallelize this process. So this is the, 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 another bit of the spectrum, but it's simultaneously, I've got a, a list of frequencies programmed in, but it's simultaneously monitoring all of those frequencies so that when any one of the channels becomes active, regardless of the state of any of the others, it can monitor that and decode it. So this is running log here of every channel that sort of became active during that time. SDR can be used to create your own open um, sorry, it can be used to create your own 2G GSM mobile base station with a popular software package called OpenBTS. So you can literally plug in the thing to your laptop, boot it up, and then phones will start camping on it. Or if you explicitly select the network and connect to it. Um, it's really cool because it um, can connect to asterisk, so you can connect it up to other um, VoIP networks by SIP. Um, and this is, was a sort of a famous debut demonstration at Burning Man. You can see they've got their amps and diagnostic equipment, and they had to put the laptop on a big block of ice just to keep it cool while it was doing its processing. Um, in addition, as I said with the Wi-Fi stuff, I've got that receiver there. Uh, I plugged in this AP. This is operating 5 gigahertz now. Um, I had uh, another network client connecting to it. This is another GNU radio flow graph. Just select the frequency that I wanted to listen at. Started up Wireshark, and it was sniffing packets off the air. And of course, you can you, know, you can do this with um, uh, a wireless card if you plug in your computer. But this actually gives you much more flexibility to look at, at lower down in terms of the signal. So you can see the beacon frames going there, uh, and then when I connect to the network, you'll actually see the raw traffic going over. Obviously, the the um, network is unsecured, but you can see it, it happening. Um, so I guess the point is that there's an enormous array of apps that you can sort of experiment with. Um, this was another one um, in the parking lot. This is Yagi pointed up into the sky. We're actually receiving weather um, images from a satellite that's passing overhead. And so this is, um, this is sort of the west coast here. Uh, and these are the two sensors um, using, sent down from one of the, the NOAA satellites using um, the APT protocol. And depending on how you combine those two pictures, you can get some nice false uh, color images. Uh, I was also up um, 
as up in San Francisco on the other side of Golden Gate Bridge about here, and so this is a piece of software that's used for um, maritime mapping, and I was receiving the transponder bursts from ships in the area that also transmit their position. And so, you know, this is this boat here, it's just sort of come about, and you can see that, that term. Um, and it's been used in radio astronomy, passive radar, um, a decoding satellite television, all sorts of things. Um, but going back to the aviation then, I actually went out and I um, sampled the signal of the radar near Moffat Air Force um, Base. And so you can see that every time the radar turns into the view of the camera, there's this massive spike. So this is actually the, the time domain plot, and this is the main radar bang. And you can see here some other stuff appearing. These are actually returns of, of probably big structures um, nearby that reflect the signal. Um, and then you can use that to sort of calculate the signal parameters of the radar. And that was really cool at the time because I was seeing these two peaks come up when I was looking at the time differences between the actual bangs that the radar would send out. And it turns out this particular radar, the ASR-9, is often put into dual PFR mode, which means that it both can track airplanes in the sky and do weather observations that are potentially fed back into you know, weather prediction services. Um, so back to MODES then, this is what MODES looks like on the waterfall. It's uh, um, the bursts are very, very short, but the bandwidth is very high, which is why you see these long lines appearing. And this is what it looks like in the time domain. So again, we saw the diagram before, this is what it actually looks like on the scope. You have the preamble, and then the rest of the, um, the information. And it's Manchester uh, encoded, so that you have these early late chips, and depending on which one you have, it's either translated as a 0 or a 1. That's how you get your individual bits out. Um, so this is... A recording of planes sort of landing and taking off around SFO, SJC, Oakland um, that I made recently. You can sort of see the, the trails building up as the traffic progresses. Now, something's about to get really um, fuzzy. Just wait for it. There we go. What is that? That's a bad transponder. So there are actually quite a few of them and they broadcast junk. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you don't believe me, you can go on the various other flight tracking uh, sites and bring up old plots for these planes and you can see that they, it's like they cross the globe in about five seconds because of this junk data. Uh, and this is sort of zooming in again uh, with San Francisco and Sabay. And you can see the various runway configurations they have at S uh, in SFO and coming in uh, on approach to Oakland and SJC is down there. Did you get the directions and orientations inherently or from their self-reported position? Uh, no, the this positioning is observational or from their report of their position? And this is all from the, the report of their position broadcast by the aircraft. Um, so this is a sort of close up on um, SFO. Someone's going to land, someone's flying overhead. Someone's going to check the transponder. Um, and this is actually me at the airport parallel landing here. Um, and I was reporting a bit of vision at the same time, so you can see them coming in. Um, this this one's touchdown, this is about to touch down, all the time. Uh, the, when the nose gear comes down and makes contact, it'll turn red, there we go. Um, and then kind of zoom along there. Um, it's quite, quite nice at night. And there's another one where a Virgin flight is taking off, this one's circled in red. This guy's passed over at a higher altitude. Um, so, there she goes. Take off while, and then as soon as the aircraft rotates, it'll go green around about there, and you'll see it sort of take off into the sky. There we go. Is there a bit in the packet that says whether it's nose wheels are on the ground? Yes, so there are two types of position reports um, there's a surface position and an airborne position, and there's also a vertical status field, so you can determine from that what the deal is. And then there's somebody on what looks to be a collision course, but actually they're already at um, 43,000 feet. So there's good vertical separation there. Um, and you can also do it in 3D. So there's that same takeoff, but you see the side view to get the 3D aspect of it. Um, and these planes are coming in to land at Oakland. And that's kind of the larger barrier, same flight there. Uh, and if you've got all that information, then why not make a virtual cockpit? <laughs> so this is as if you're sitting in the pilot seat, sped up a little bit, but take off, and then it comes around, and there's that other plane there. Um, and 
This site actually, I run live 24-7 for Sydney, so if you were to go to my website, you can get the live um, feed for the entirety of Sydney. Australia has a much greater ADSB rollout of its um, <coughs> domestic jets than in the States. Um, so there are heaps of them, you can click on one around Sydney and you can get the, the, the there's San Francisco, um, get the cockpit view. Oh, okay. And this is um, coming back from um, Virginia one time. Uh, I was recording, um, and so this is obviously sped up, but this is the approach into SFO. And it's really weird if you look Google's kind of 3D um, extrusion of these burnt out shells of planes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a little disturbing. <laughs> uh, and so this is the same thing for the Bay Area, but um, in Google Earth. And if you have a look closely here, in a moment you'll see these sort of loops appear as planes sort of come in and then do a couple of loops. There's one, there'll be sort of tidal loops here in a minute. Maybe, there we go, there's one, there's another one. And I think that's probably to do with congestion and SFO, so air traffic controllers are telling them to hold in a pattern for a moment, and then there's another one up there. Um, so, that's that. So the, the software that sort of works behind this I've been working on for a while, it's Called, I call it Aviation Mapper, and this is a picture of um, the runways at uh, Sydney Airport. You can see the, the planes taxiing around, taking off. Um, this is my friend Matt Robert and I. Uh, he kind of let me use his USRP before I actually had, had my own one to play with. And we we're on, a, on the top of a hill overlooking uh, Sydney Airport with all, all the gear that we would take up. And um, you know, we, we got things working, and, and we were quite happy. <laughs> um, so you see some interesting things. The Queen visited Australia, and this is her plane. Um, and the ID is R E G L one, Regal one. Um, sometimes transpond into a program like this. <laughs> um, so this is the Google Earth sort of view for Sydney. And there's another system that I built into it, and you can see all these balloons popping up and these little markers appearing on the trails. This is a separate communication system called ACARS, and this is another bad transport. And they, um, it uses a different frequency, but it, it is used to send messages between the, the cockpit, pilots, air traffic control, and line operations. Um, the engines can also send back performance reports to Rolls Royce, for example. And it's mostly in the clear. Uh, this is sort of another view you can see um, from Sydney Airport, sort of from the side. You can see sort of planes coming in there, and then they do the loop to, to be vectored in. Um, and you can see a lot of these sort of um, markers appear on landing and takeoff. So this is when you were to look at those messages transmitted in the frequency domain, so they're sort of short bursts. And um, again, the cool thing about SDR is now I'm actually decoding all three channels in the Bay Area simultaneously. So I've spin up three versions of the de decoder. And then when it, there's a message on any of the channels, then it prints it out here. Um, so what's that? Just random sort of data coming from the planes. Um, but it contains the flight ID and the, the registration number, which is like the MAC address. Yes, question? Question, have you looked at any of the Army planes or any of the drones to see, to see how No, I haven't. <laughs> Actually, if I had, I probably would say I had not anyway, right? <laughs> So, so when you watch this uh, SFO airplane or the FBI and, like approach you and hey what are you doing? Um, as I said I've hidden a lot of slides, but um, I was up on San Bruno and um, this I was parked in a residential area because I had a nice view down to the airport. And um, this guy came out looking really mean, there's a big dog asking what I was doing, and I told him and he seemed fine with it disappeared five minutes later the police turned up. <laughs> but it was all good. We had a nice chat about the nice view and the nice night, and and, um, and uh, you know, that was all good. Um, you didn't get hassled. What? You didn't get hassled by the by the police? No, I just told them what they were doing, and and. I just see the model saying you were tracking the flights in the she, she was really, really nice. <laughs> I think I was quite lucky. If, if it would have been some other person on, on a bad night in a cranky mood, it might not have been fun. Um, so, now, so th these are some examples of ACARS messages. 
Um, I have this running joke that I might be hypersensitive to it now, but every single time I ever look at one of these messages, it's always something to do about the toilets on the aircraft. Um, so I always see something about the, you know, the toilets being blocked or whatever. But, um, so this one is an inoperative toilet. Um, here we have the lav hard. I assume that this means that the lavatory has failed with a hard failure mode. Um, and then you know, another lav hard. And I thought, screw it. Easter egg time on the map. <laughs> so whenever there's a toilet failure, instead of having a little coloured duck, you get a gut. Uh, you know, uh, another cool thing is that they often transmit the flight plans with the waypoints over A cards. So the system listens for those and actually plots the um, plots the waypoints out. So you can see these planes would be heading uh, west and they would be heading up uh, through Asia. So that's planes. Um, with fast track, I'm sure you all know what fast track is, um, but the actual badge contains your ID, and that's what's interrogated by the toll booths as you drive through. So there's a wake up signal that's sent um, to your tag to wake it up from deep sleep, because it has actually a long life lithium battery in it, so it's sleeping most of the time. And interestingly, it's also pulse position modulated, like mode S. Uh, but the interesting thing about the tag is that it doesn't actively transmit any RF back. It uses this thing called backscatter modulation. So the transmitter on the booth is constantly transmitting and the tag changes its radar cross-section in a manner that can be picked up by the booth. Um, so you need a special sort of way of doing that. You can't just hook an antenna up into your radio. Um, but I was driving around. These ones, as you'll notice, are not at a toll booth. You probably see them up and down 101 and supposedly it's used for the 511 um, traffic information service, but also it's a very good way for the authorities to monitor when your tag passes through a particular point on the highway. Or this is actually more in San Francisco. This is me with my own Yagi pointed up, listening um, to the interrogation signal, having a look and recording it. Uh, and this is you know, the, the booze at the Golden Gate Bridge. But the way um, you know, to actually do it um, is this is my little experimental setup with my tag, a Yagi antenna, USRP, and this thing here is an RF circulator. And they're really nice because you can pass in RF energy. It will come out, go in one port, come out the adjacent port, uh, and not continue on in this loop. So the idea is that I'm transmitting the interrogation signal in here. It comes out into the antenna. Whatever energy is reflected back from the tag will come back in here and then go out to the receive on the radio. Because obviously, you don't want energy coming from here and then going into here. Otherwise, it will just blow out your radio. Um, and with this sort of little device, you can just get um, the energy that's coming back from the tag. And so um, this is the signal that's going out, and um, this is the interrogation that's sent out through the antenna. There's no signal here. Um, and then when I actually put my tag near the antenna, then you can see this backscattered signal appearing here. And this actually contains um, the ID of my tag, which I'm sort of covered up there. Um, but, of course, the, the point is that there was no authentication mechanism at all, so um, you, know, you can basically go around and read anybody's tag. Um, and this is the flow graph. You know, I'll show you that simple AM1. This is getting a little bit more complicated. Um, but this was an excellent resource, um, Hacking Toll Systems. This was in Black Hat 2008. They looked at it more from a sort of... Um, chip reversing point of view um, as opposed to the RF. Um, so very briefly then, I also looked at um, trying to receive signals from satellites. Um, a lot of satellites, like digital TV ones, will just um, effectively be an, an RF megaphone. So you send up a signal and it will broadcast it out over an entire country, which makes um, it easy to listen to things. Uh, the Optus D1 satellite was one that looks over Australia and does a lot of um, TV, but there's also a lot of other stuff there. And um, this is actually a publicly available frequency plan for the satellite. Um, so you can get the, you know, the command carriers, the telemetry downlinks, um, how the transponders are arranged. And these are the publicly available pics from their Earth station, this is where they send the signals up. Um, and this is like a, a commonly known satellite modem, so you can download the manual and see what sort of settings they might be operating at. Uh, what do you need to receive stuff? You need a satellite, you need a dish, you need a low noise block down converter, and you need an SDR. So this is actually the telemetry signal from that satellite. And it's got um, like a one pulse per second thing here, the telemetry sidebands are here, and if you actually decode the information on the telemetry and create these raster plots, you can see 
that there's actually information being transmitted there in some sort of organized fashion. And if you look closely, you can see these triangles forming, which in a Rasa plot means that it's some sort of counter that's incrementing by one through each line. So the you know, satellite's definitely ticking over. Uh, the question is, there are all these other sort of transmissions up there. You know, what do they mean? Um, you can make some assumptions about the signal, and then you can use a couple of DSP tricks to, to reverse the properties of the signal bit by bit to try and figure out what the ones and zeros are again. So I found these narrowband signals here, and um, I picked one. And then if I want to figure out what the order of the modulation is, so I assumed it was phase shift keying. Um, with phase shift keying, there's a certain number of um, bits that can go into any symbol that's transmitted through this phase shift keyed stream. And you need to figure out how many bits go into one symbol. So you can you can do this simple trick of um, raising the, the samples to a power of, of whatever, and then when you get these peaks, you've got it. So this is actually two bits per symbol. That's the first step. Next, you need to figure out the rate at which the symbols are being transmitted. So the board rate, like the modems. Uh, this peak here means that it's just the standard 9600. And then this forward error correction on there, so you know you, you can uh, recover bits if you lose some. And I just assumed that it was some sort of common um, forward error correction that's very popular. And I just mucked around with the various settings. I automated this later, but once you go through the permutations, uh, the error rate drops to zero, which means that you've locked on the correct parameters. And then you get something like that. And you think, great, I've done all that work and it still looks like noise. Well, actually, it's because it's scrambled. So if you use try one of the common D scramblers, it looks like that. But you've still got long strings of ones and zeros, which is not good. So it's probably differentially encoded. So then you differentially decode it and you get that. And it's really good because you can see these repeating um, sort of patterns. Now, if you look at the raw ones and zeros, you need to do a search through there to find commonly repeating patterns, which are likely going to be the header um, to some sort of packet. So I found that. And then I found that it was some character-oriented frame. So you can see sort of familiar synchronization bytes, startup header, startup text, end of text, CRC. Um, and then you've got a number of fixed length messages in there. So once you parse all that out, you can see that you've got this format, um, and then you've got signed bytes, unsigned bytes, BCD encoded stuff. And then, you know, it's a very similar situation, right? And you think, you know, what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Truth be told, I have no idea. I only listened and recorded on this channel for two minutes, and as it turned out, it was far too short a period to make anything of it. But if I was to have recorded over a month, say, you could start correlating things. I actually did graph it, so I reckon if you graph this over a long period of time, you could start extracting patterns. But at least, you know, it creates pretty squiggly lines. At least that was <laughs> the, the outcome there. Um, there's another one, so this is all up at satellite frequencies. If you go out to really low frequencies, this is a military mode that's used on HF to get propagation all around the world. Um, and then I applied the same techniques and I was able to correctly identify that signal and start you know, decoding it. So you can apply this sort of thing to a lot of different signals out there. Uh, and just to finish up, how am I doing for time? Uh, yeah, I, this will just be two more minutes. Um, direction finding is not so much about decoding the message, rather figuring out where the transmission is coming from. So it's used in signals intelligence, emergency aid, wildlife tracking, all sorts of things. Um, this is a really, really big um, receiver in Germany, uh, and it's used to determine where long wave transmissions are coming from on, on sort of a global scale. Um, and the first thing I used was the Doppler effect, so you can use this approach called pseudo-Doppler direction finding. I'm sure you all know what the Doppler effect is, but you can apply it with radio frequencies. So the idea is that you have this wave coming through your antenna, but you rotate the antenna through this circle. And so every time the antenna moves into the wave, it'll get compressed and the frequency will change. And as it comes out the other way, the it'll you know, go in the direction of the wave and then the frequency will change in the other way. So you get this Doppler shift occurring on your radio wave. And the neat thing is because it's changing the frequency, you can use an FM radio, FM demodulator, to detect that Doppler tone and it will actually appear as this single sine wave. And the trick is then you compare the phase of that sine wave with a reference and then that will give you the incident angle of your um, radio wave. So it's actually a really elegant way of doing it with FM. The problem is if you rotate an antenna, then for my gratuitous um, transition, you need to rotate it that fast, which is pretty physically impossible. So the idea is that you actually use fixed antennas, multiple fixed antennas, and you ro rotate electronically through them at a very fast rate. 
So this is what your sort of normal little unit would look like that you would have in your car and plug into your radio. Uh, but I wanted to use SDR, so I sort of made this this sort of setup: custom antennas on the roof, um, USRP with an antenna switch, and um, I sort of did an FPGA mod so that I could extract the sample clock from the FPGA, and that would be used to actually um, rotate the antennas and control the antenna switch. And it was really nice because it meant everything would stay in lockstep. Um, but this is sort of a close-up there, a uh, bit of a flow graph. Um, I won't go through the details, but like the, you know, the USRP signals come in there, it gets filtered, FMD modulated, the reference is created here, and then this area is used to compare the phases. Um, so this is the Doppler tone that comes out on the, on the, on the spectrum. Um, this is your sort of reference and measured um, signals. You calculate the phase difference and then you have your direction. So we thought we'd test it out, find a nice transmitter, um, look up the frequency of a, of a control channel that's active all the time, drive around, and then eventually you know, everything sort of converges on, on the X. So it kind of worked. Um, I did that again and I figured this is Mountain View. You probably can imagine who has offices here. I thought if they get to drive around with vehicles or all sorts of stuff on their roof, I'll, uh, I'll do that and drive through their campus. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that, that was a bit of that. There's another way of doing it. I won't go into details now, but use a bit of math. And instead of using one radio, it uses multiple radios. You get much higher resolution, but the cost is that you need multiple radios. Um, and so this is um, sort of a fancy radio that Edis Research makes with four channels. Um, it acquires a target and then locks on with a thing, and you can see here very quickly, there's one of those USB missile launchers, and so I'm standing there with a the little radio, and as I move the radio left and right, it sort of follows. <laughs> oh. And now, and now when, I, when I say fire, I'm going to bring it back up and say fire, I don't know if you can hear it. Fire! <laughs> it's, shot, it's shot in the direction of the radio. Um, so... That's that. This is another GNU radio block. Um, I sort of published most of the stuff in my GitHub repository. So just to finish off, if you're doing direction finding, make sure you've got your ham radio license, make sure you have a string running through your antenna array just in case one of them pops off because these are used to carry glass, it's just a suction cap. So I call that structural redundancy. Um, look clean shaven um, and hide any Motorola or XTS radios because these are also used by the police and they don't know that they can be used legitimately by hams. Um, okay, to finish off, to conclude, do not try any of this. Um, I'm going to read out the first bit and then you can read the actual text. So, if you don't like a doctor or a nurse, so this is about pages. Because so you, you can transmit, right? So, is your arch nemesis in the hospital? Oh. <laughs> it's a distract security. So, these automated alerts were sent out of the page system so the security wouldn't have to go there and check it out. So, with mode S, Want to reach cruising altitude a little quicker? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think a pilot made the wrong choice and decided to land? <laughs> Want to display a message to everyone's radar screen? So you know this ASCII art? <laughs> okay, and then with ACARS, if you don't want to fly on a particular aircraft, because these sorts of things are sent over that system. Was the flight a little bumpy? Oh, it's Rolls Royce. Um, do you need to message the cockpit privately? No. So actually, in the spec, there are labels that sort of dictate what kind of messages is and where, that, where it should go. And there's one specifically for cockpit printer one, two, three, and four. Um, and so with satellite stuff, the uplink power sent from the Earth is usually kept at a minimum to save money. Um, so it depends on the weather. If it's a clear day, they might only use a few watts. But if it's heavy, lots of moisture in the air, they need to crank up the power. Um, so if it's a clear day, then you might not need that much power to, to get up. Um, and also in their, in their documentation, it says that, um, that there's an uplink um, power control system. And if you don't set it up properly, then it can severely damage the TWTA, which is the... Um, the yeah, the, the so traveling rate tube amplifiers, thank you. Had a, had a metal blank for a second. Um, so, yeah, so if you have a UPC or you emulate a UPC that is bad, then you can permanently damage the amplifier on the transponder. 
and it'll be a little difficult to fix it, I think. Um, and finally, fast rate. You don't want to ever play, pay a toll again. Because <laughs> you can get legitimate ideas, right? Just go to a car park. <laughs> want traffic management to think there's an auto stampede? <laughs> <laughs> and then you want to keep tabs on someone and just you know look out for their ID. Uh, I went to the baseball recently. <laughs> so there's always SDR. You should get a little bored. Um, so remember the most important thing is be safe. You want to transmit, um, do the ham radio test, and get a license, and then you can you know, transmit on the frequencies. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.